So as I said earlier, Pastor Robert Johnson has returned to work. Last time he preached, he was actually not too far after cancer, and he was, well, that was a very tired season, but you have lots of energy today, right? Amen. Lots of energy. And, um, but Robert, I found out Robert has is, is been invited to preach here. He also needs to fill in to preach in another church at 11.30, right? So there's a time limit for you. So, I mean, you can't go too long. <laughs> but we're thankful to have you. Enough of me. Uh, Robert, come on up. Thank you, brother. All right. Praise the Lord. Hey, praise the Lord. Could you do something for me? Because I know you're going to pray again. Yeah. I forgot a prayer request. Oh, um, Stephanie. Yeah, I, I just received it from Kevin. Stephanie is having her baby today, right, Ooh. Kevin? But, but this baby is how early? One day after the day of viability. So this is a very small baby. So when you pray, could you also lift up Stephanie and sure. the baby today? Sure, will. Thank you, brother. Praise the Lord. Amen. Come on, you guys. Let's get with it. Praise the Lord. Amen. You know what? We serve the... We serve the God of the universe. There is none more powerful, none more dynamic, none more loving and caring, none like him. He's worthy. So when we say he's worthy, we say praise the Lord. He's worthy. Okay, he's worthy to me. Praise him. All right. God is good. Give him a hand. As Greg mentioned the last time I spoke, I was probably five weeks out of surgery for cancer. And that day, I was, you know, I was dealing with my head. I can do this, Eunice. Eunice said, I don't know if you can do this. She said, I said, I can do it, Eunice. It took me three days to recover after that. <laughs> so I learned a lot. Sometimes my head goes above what my heart says, but the fact is God is good anyway. I want to bow for a word of prayer and ask God to take me out of the equation and allow him to do his thing. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come thanking you, God, for the honor and the privilege to share your word. And I ask God for your blessing, God, that you would use these words and allow them to, to reign on the ears uh, and the minds and the hearts of every person here. And then, God, a special blessing for Stephanie, God. I pray, God, that you are in that delivery room with your hands on every doctor, every instrument, God. You know exactly what needs to happen. You know what needs to be determined and how it needs to happen. So, Lord, we place her in your hands, and we know that your hands are the best hands. Your hands are the sure hands, and I'm confident, Lord, that you are with her and that you'll never leave her or forsake her. So, God, thank you for hearing our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, I pray. Amen. Amen. I love coming to church because I get to say Jesus. You know, uh, in my profession, sometimes you can't do that because there's so many different levels of denominational kind of things. But the one thing that I do that they can't take away is the love of Jesus Christ. And I always Amen. use that. That is my, my thing. Amen. But anyway, we're going to get into the word. And the, and the title of this word is Human Reactions After Holy Exertions. I'm so glad that my brother caught my typo and fixed me. I didn't have to get up and do a big explanation, so that's a good thing. But this is the part that really encourages me about this one brother that we're going to be speaking about today. Let me slow down. I've had five cups of coffee and I'm a little wired. <laughs> but the fact is this. God is so good and so gracious, and the fact that he left his word for us to be able to just kind of mull over is just a wonderful thing. It encourages me when I read about Elijah. Elijah is one of the greatest prophets of all time. One of the great things about him, and he's not only mentioned in the, in the Old Testament, but he's mentioned in the New Testament, and, and he's at the greatest party ever recorded with Moses and Jesus, and, and, and the rest of the three of the other disciples were there, and they were so blown away by what they saw, they had to cover themselves and get on the floor and, and in the cloud, but the fact is, God obviously wants us to take notice of this great prophet. It encourages me when I read James 5, 17. It says, Elijah was a human just as we are. I have the tendency sometimes to, to idolize Bible figures, but they're just like us. And that's important for us to know because we have the same power and ability that they have because we're connected to the same Savior who is the same then as he'll be today, as he'll be tomorrow. So we can be confident that we can trust 
what the Lord is saying. See, the Bible is the word of truth, and it describes the warts and the wrinkles and all those different deficiencies that each one of these heavy-duty men and women of God had. So the one, one thing I love about it in, in the word of God, it talks about in, in Hebrews 4, that the word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It can examine us, and everything is laid bare before him whom we all must give an account. So, so when James uh, wrote these words, he undoubtedly was talking about First uh, Kings 18 and 19. For these chapters, we see Elijah in his greatest moments, and we also see him at his lowest. How many of you ever been on a retreat? where you go on this mountaintop experience and you start to, you know, you, you hear this great word, you feel like God has downloaded his spirit into you personally and you're ready to go accomplish great things for God. Have you ever felt that way? Several years ago, I was in Colorado and I was at Snake River and I wanna, I'm, I'm one of these guys that I can get out by myself and I walk along the river and I talk out loud to God. And I'm like, God, I want you to break my heart for what breaks yours. I want to be a dynamic man of God, and I want to see things that these guys saw, and I want to be just like them. And nothing happened. I didn't hear a word from God. I didn't see anything. There was no bolt of lightning, nothing. Then I went back to my neighborhood, or at least the city that I served, and I saw things that I'd never seen, even though they were on the same streets that I frequented all the time. What happened? God allowed me to see a revelation. And he, and he does that from time to time. Commercial, the retreat is in Santa Cruz. You want to get downloaded, brothers, that's the place to go. Okay. <laughs> that was their commercial, brother. Anyway. So when you go on these retreats, one of the things that happens to us is that we, we're so filled with the Spirit, we can't wait to get back to family, friends, our community and share what God has shared with us. And the beautiful thing is what we feel like we're confident if they hear and they see what we've seen, if I can articulate what God has poured into my spirit with my friends and family, they'll be transformed. They'll be, they'll be enlightened. They'll experience the same revelation that I experienced. It is through experiences like that, that we feel empowered sometimes. And sometimes we feel like that's, that's what God is doing. Because God has revealed some things on the mountaintop in your hearts, sometimes when he does that, we have to be careful. Because we could be just like Elijah. Elijah, like Pastor O just talked about last week. I call him Pastor O because I butchered his name enough and I'm not going to do it anymore. So Pastor O shared with us last week about how Elijah was on the, on the mountaintop on, with, on Carmel with the prophets of Baal. He knocked them all off, killed them all. Great thing, right? I, if I was Elijah, I would have been. Did you see what I did? I mean, you know, that's the kind of thing we have to be careful about because we can have what they call spiritual confidence or spiritual pride. And I'm sure Elijah suffered a little bit of that. I would have. Man, did you see what I did to those 800 prophets? I took them all out with the power of God. That's a great thing. Of course, he would feel that way, and I would feel that way too. But when God worked an overwhelming miracle through Elijah in defeating the prophets of Baal, Elijah had to be on that mountaintop experience because if he had just accomplished all that stuff through him, that is something special. Now, when we think uh, things like that happen to us, we just like I said, we've got to be careful about being overconfident. But what happened to Elijah was when Ahab went and told Jezebel what went down. Let's read the scriptures. Let's kind of go through it and see what, what, what happened. Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, may the gods punish me and do so, uh, and do so severely if I don't make your life like one of them by this time tomorrow. Then Elijah became afraid and immediately ran for his life. This brother had just knocked off 400, 800 prophets, basically, and now he's running from a woman who sent him a letter? <laughs> Come on, she's not even face to face with him. She sent him a letter. The fact is, 
Jezebel was a master at deception. She knew how to push buttons. She felt it was probably better than to kill him right off. She could put the mental pressures on this guy. Because, you know, after we get through doing some of these great things, then those times of spiritual exertion, if you will, we're exhausted. Sometimes, like, I preached that day, and I was so tired. I couldn't believe that I was tired as I was. And this is something like what this gentleman was experiencing. See, Elijah retreated before a defeated enemy. Sometimes we've already got the victory, but we take off and run before we realize that we've done it. And that's what happened with this man, this gentleman. For three years, Elijah had not made a move without hearing and obeying the Lord's instructions. But now he was running ahead of the Lord in order to save his own life. I don't know if you've ever had fear before, if you've ever been scared, but it will make you do crazy things. When God's servants get out of his will, they are liable to do all sorts of foolish things and, and basically fall, fail in their strongest points. When we are at our most powerful position, sometimes we'll just step away from it because of fear of the unknown. And we forget that God has made promises to us and he says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Sometimes we just get off balance. I know I do. And that's why it's so important that we need to stay in connection with God each and every day. Well, the same thing happened to us. We're no different than Elijah. The same thing will happen to us. We're human, just like him. Hallelujah. That's a good thing. He was walking by faith, uh, by sight, and not by faith. It's a dangerous thing to do, to walk by what we see and not by what we experience, experience in the spirit. That's an important thing. When Abraham left, fled from Egypt, he failed in his faith, which was his greatest strength. Can you imagine that? We know him by his faith, but he failed at his greatest strength. David's greatest strength was his integrity. But that failed when he started lying and started scheming about to deal with Bathsheba. Moses was the meekest man in the world. And yet, his temper cost him the forfeiture of entrance into the promised land. Peter was a courageous man, yet he failed because he denied Christ. And like Peter, Elijah was a bold man, and his courage failed him when, when he heard Jezebel's message, Jezebel's message. It's amazing what fear will do. Paralyzes even the greatest, takes us out of sync, knocks us off our spiritual axis, if you will. We're off balance when we're afraid. But when we're connected to God, we're powerful. Yeah. That's where we have to realize our source of strength. See, Elijah gives us some messages here. He, he articulates, from, I'm going to articulate four messages that, that are in this passage, but there's several more. But there's some things that we, as a people of God, really want to just kind of connect on and, and hang in with. Okay. Queen Jezebel had threatened Elijah's life and he ran because he felt afraid. He felt depressed. He felt abandoned. He felt discouraged. Have you ever felt that way? Yeah. I felt that way many times. One time I was on a gurney and I was going into surgery and I had to put up the, the, the spiritual front that I was doing okay, but I was, I was scared. I was, you know, you're going under a knife and I know, or, and that doesn't have to be the reason why you're afraid. Sometimes we're afraid because our children are off kilter, our job might be in jeopardy, whatever it is, fear can cripple us and paralyze us. And just like Elijah, we can, we can go through that same kind of uh, experience. Often discouragement set in after great spiritual experiences, especially those requiring spiritual effort involving great emotion. Those are the things that can take us out. And we have to always, the thing is, we just want to make these little spiritual checkpoints to know that these are things that are after us. Just like this morning. Nobody wants, you know, in preparing this message, I had the hardest time, the most difficult time getting this together. 
I've been doing this stuff for years. This morning, my computer wouldn't print it, couldn't get the stuff off the printer, couldn't send a note, couldn't, couldn't access email, couldn't do anything. I was like, God, what's up with this? But then, you know, when we're connected to God, God always has a backup plan. He says, there's a computer in your office. Go to your office and print that thing out and go ahead and finish it up there. So this morning, I went to my office and finished this thing. Isn't that amazing? No, it's not amazing. It's just how God will direct you if we stay connected and just in close proximity of what he's trying to do. Okay. So when, when those emotions and stuff spill over and we get knocked off balance, it's an example of human reaction versus the holy excursion. Elijah sank to a level so deep that he prayed that he might die. Kill me, Lord. I'm no better than anybody. He says it, but he went on a day's journey into the wilderness, and he sat down on a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, he said, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my father's. A typical day's journey in the Jewish life, a day's journey was between 20 and 30 miles. So this brother was doing his second marathon. He had done one when he ran and outran Ahab when the rain, right? And so this guy was pretty physically fit. He's running, I mean, he's moving out like that. So God had a plan, even in his fear. God will work if you'll stop and pay attention. He'll give us a spiritual second chance. So the first um, message that comes through this particular piece is the angel's message of grace. There's a message of grace in this one. This brother was stumbling. God picked him up and said, this is what he did. He said, then he laid down and he, and he slept under a broom tree. And suddenly, an angel touched him, and the angel told him, get up and eat. Then he looked, at, and there at his head was a loaf of bread baked over hot stones and a jug of water. So he ate, and he drank, and he laid down again. Kind of tells you a little bit about the fatigue that this brother was experiencing, the level of depression, the depths that his soul had sank to. That verse kind of speaks to that a little bit. So if we kind of get into where Elijah's head was. So then the angel of the Lord returned the second time and touched him and said, get up and eat or the journey will be too much for you. It's important that we get that second time the angel of the Lord came because there's been a lot of controversy about, well, the first time it was a, the first time that, that when he was eating that there was a, a, a traveler that may have helped him out and given him that. But the scripture is clear. It says that the angel of the Lord, in caps, returned a second time. It's good stuff. So that is the grace of God working and his fatigue, working when he didn't feel discounted, working when he didn't feel like he was ready. So he got up and he ate and he drank. And then the strength from the food, from the food, he walked 40 miles day and night to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. Forty days and 40 nights he walked. The second message is the creator's message of power. Here he entered a cave and he spent the night. And when Elisha fled from Mount Sinai, see, he fled to Mount Sinai, he was returning to the sacred place where God had met Moses and had given him the law of the people. Very significant, the law of the people. So he was making a, a connection. If we get back into 17 when he did the transfiguration, two things happened there. The, the law of the prophets was, was there as well as the law for us. And so there they made connection and God was saying, this is where I'm, I'm binding you spiritually. Plus Jesus was there to seal the deal, right? So that's all good. So obviously God had given Elijah special instruction to travel this great distance over 200 miles without additional food. Like Moses before him and Jesus after him, Elijah, 40 days and 40 nights. We used to try to do this little thing uh, years back, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. I never made it. Never made it that long. I fast for a little while while I was sick. And now I can't gain the weight back. So if you know a spiritual seamstress, I could use them. Help me take in my pants. No. 
Then the Lord came and he said to him, what are you doing? Elijah's laying in the tree, what are you doing? God always asked these reflective questions. What is that you have in your hand? Who told you you were naked? God already knows the answer to the question. But I, Elijah's response should have been, not doing nothing. I'm laying under the broom tree trying to rest. Sometimes we try to manufacture spiritual answers when the real thing is we're not doing nothing. In 1 Kings 19, he's uh, defining his relationship with the Lord. Boy, he says, God, I've been very zealous for the Lord of hosts, but the Israelites have abandoned your covenant, tore down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword, and I am left, and they are looking for me to take my life. Does that sound like he's afraid? But he's trying to say, look, God, I'm the one. I've been out here doing all this great stuff for you. Everybody's cut you loose except for me. I don't know what the rest of the Israelites are doing, but this is where I am. You ever feel like that? Like you're alone? Like you're the only one doing God's work? Nobody hears the, what God is saying with you. This is what he was feeling. He was like, wow, nobody's getting this. At that moment, the Lord passed by. He said, go stand on the mountain in the Lord's presence. And the Lord passed by, and a great and mighty wind was tearing the mountains and was shattering the cliffs before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And the wind was uh, there, and after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a voice, a soft whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And suddenly the voice came and said it again, what are you doing here, Elijah? This is a very interesting passage when you start thinking about it. God wasn't in the wind. It was tearing up the mountains and, the, and, and that whole bit. He was not in the earthquake. He was not in the fire, but he was in a whisper. What's in the whisper? It's an example of God's spirit transmitting his message to us. We need to be always mindful of what the spirit is saying. The spirit is always consistent with the word of God. That is the way we tie it together. The word of God will never, never be different than what the spirit is saying. They work, they work hand in hand. They're together. It's a beautiful thing. They're there and they're together. God often speaks through the gentle and the obvious rather than the spectacular and the unusual. That's why it's important that we try to train ourselves to look for him in the everyday mundane things. When the plate of grass, I noticed that they all are different and none of them are the same. The leaves on the trees are all have their own identity. They, none of them have the same identity. You and I all have different fingerprints. Our eyes are all different regardless if they're the same color or what. There's nothing like us that's exactly alike because God is so unique in how he manufactures and crafts us. See, so when we start thinking about how good God is, we need to always rejoice in how he's made us and how uniquely he, he's doing things. You know, in, in, in this time, I've had a lot of time to reflect on God's power and God's hand in my life. And it's an amazing thing to see how God is working through human pain, human discouragement, human breakdown. You know, finally, I've come to the point where I said, thank you, God, for the cancer. Can you believe that? Thank you, God, for the pain that I experienced. Can you believe that? Thank you, God, for leaving my stomach open like a cracked watermelon so I could look down into myself and see what I'm made. I, I, man, when it was going on, it was terrible. But the fact is, looking back in reflection, God has allowed me to see that he is really setting up a new destination, if you will. He's saying, okay, I want to take you to a new place in me. And that's basically what he was doing with this brother. When we go through those the roller coasters of life, the highs and lows, the spiritual journey of being on the 
mountaintop, and then being Lord, we have to stop and ask God, what are you trying to say to me, God? Where are you trying to take me? Because he's not going to leave you or forsake you. He's got a plan for you. He doesn't waste a thing. Every good or bad experience in your life, God will use if you will allow him to touch your mind in a spiritual way. And in a spiritual way of connecting with God is through his word. Now, the beautiful, this is, this is, this is Isaiah's thing. I mean, Elijah's peace. He's saying, wow, God, I was zealous for you. What does that say about him as an individual? It says a lot. He was connected to God. He wanted to be in relationship with God like nothing else. He put himself in his own mind above everyone else in his relationship with God. Hmm, it's interesting. God has work for us to do even when we feel fear and failure. And God always has more resources and people than we know about. It's always amazing. I'm, I think sometimes it's up to me, it's up to me, it's up to me. And it's never up to me. Although I have to do my part, you have to do your part. It's up to God ultimately. And he will never fall short of what he's supposed to do. Although you and I might wish to do amazing things for God, we need to focus on developing our relationship with him. See, that's the key. That's what this whole thing spells out, is that Elijah had a relationship with God that was second to none. The real miracle in Elijah's life was he was very, he was in a very personal relationship with God. And we can have the same thing. It's available to us. That's why God makes it so clear he was an ordinary man, just like you and I, an ordinary person. I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, he replied. But the Israelites have abandoned your covenant. They've torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left. And they're looking for me to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, go and return to where you came to the woods of Damascus, and when you arrive, you are to anoint Haziel, king of Aram, and you are the Jehu of Nimshi, king over Israel, and Elijah, son of Sapphot, from Abel, Mehola, as the prophet to take your place. What does that say? We all sometimes get ministries. You know, I love ministry. I've been in ministry for a long time. One of the most difficult things for me in ministry was yielding to my replacement. You think God wants us to stay in one position for the rest of our lives? He does not. And I say he's making that clear to us in this particular passage. He says, look, brother, I'm going to move you on. But look, you're going to get a chance to anoint these three individuals, which is a fantastic thing. So, uh, so Jehu will put to death whoever escapes the sword of Ahaziel, and Elijah will put to death whoever escapes the sword of Jehu. But I will leave 7,000 in Israel, every knee that has not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So no matter how often his servants fail, God never uh, loses his focus on what they must do. Our job is to obey God's word and get up and do it. See, Elijah was at that point. Elijah was at that point where he felt like, "Wow, I'm worn out. I can't do anything." But God will empower you. See what God did? He restored him. He says, "Look, I'm gonna take the weight off you. I want you to know that you're not alone." There's 7,000 other brothers and sisters out there that I'm going to work with, and they're going to stand here and hold down this part, but I'm going to get you to go ahead and do something a little different for me. And think about what the beauty of this thing is. The, he had influences on the king of Israel for the future. He had influences not only on the prophet that's going to take his place, but he got a chance to train him. And you know what his reward was? This guy never died. He never died. He was taken up in a whirlwind. Isn't that amazing? 
Elijah had complained because the past generations had failed and the present, and the present generation had not done much better. Now God had called him to equip future generations by anointing two kings and a prophet. That's good stuff. So sometimes when we're getting in a, a transition of ministry, don't get caught up in like, oh, well, what am I going to do now? <laughs> oh, what was me? We all get there. I've been there. I was there last week, yesterday. Anyway, <laughs> but the fact is, we all get there. But the fact is we can go to the, fuel, the refueling station of the word of God and have it downloaded into our spirit where we can speak confidently about who God is and knowing what he'll do. You know, one of the things that I'm, that I'm not necessarily surprised about, but I marvel at how God came to my rescue. He comes to your rescue as well. When we're emotionally spent, God will come in the form of another person sharing an encouraging word. Amen. Someone laying a hand on, the, on your back just out of nowhere. And you'll wonder, why did he touch me? Every good and perfect gift comes from above. And the fact is this, God moves in the human heart to make them do spiritual things. And we are all at God's, for lack of a better term, beck and call. He will use us to restore nation. He will use us to do mighty things. This has been the most encouraging week for me. Although I've been depleted physically, as far as my emotional, uh, well, emotionally and physically, but I, I would go down the hallways of the hospital and there were times when I would walk and I knew I was tired. And someone would come and give me a hug and he says, I'm glad you're back. And it was something about that that would encourage me and it would allow me to have just a new, renewed spirit, or maybe just a little bit of encouragement. Well, see, the same thing God will do for you when we recognize God's gifts. God gives each of us a gift in that same fashion. Elijah got a chance to anoint his successor, Elijah, because he had complained about past generations. God wants to do something so special in this church, I'm telling you. There's things that are going on here. We're, on the, we're just on the cusp of moving into a direction so dynamic. I get excited when I see Pastor O because he gets, he gets here and he's, he's, just, he's always moving with his coffee, the whole bit. I thank God for you, brother. And I pray that you never take what's going on here lightly. Because God's using you in a powerful way. He's using each and every one of us in a powerful way. But the fact is he wants us all to recognize that we're not just floating in here on Sunday to get some hymns, a few words, and go home. God's saying, walk by faith, not by sight. Go out and share the love of Christ. And when necessary, use words. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come thanking you for the honor to share your word. And I pray that we all could be like Elijah. We can have our spiritual ups, and we will understand our spiritual downs. But most of all, we want to understand our relationship with you and what we're connected to you in a powerful way. And we say that in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.